I was on the, um, to continue what I was talking about, about long stretches of not writing. And in my case, I know why, you know, I, a lot of people, they draw on their depression and stuff with, um, and that's where they write from. But I think where I started writing from, because I can remember, um, I'd be in class and the teacher would be talking and I just, you know, just would start writing stuff. I wrote, I just would start writing a story or writing something down, you know, that I really like that, you know, something or writing a story or something. Um, and I think it had to do with ADHD or whatever the crap that stuff was. But of course, um, 50 years ago, 48, 49 years ago, nobody knew what that was. You know, you were just a bad kid or you couldn't concentrate or, you know, whatever was was going on, but um, that's okay. And so what I did was, I think, I learned how to channel it. And something else I had to learn was to take a certain amount of criticism. Um, that's uh, AD a um, trait that we can't take criticism even constructive criticism we because we're criticized all the time and like I said we are um, we're at the mercy of this person who um, whose brain is being um, manipulated by a chemical outside their body so they're not sane, and they are you know dumping their stuff you know on you and therefore you, you know, you just, you just, you get very, very sensitive to, um, criticism. Now, not that I'll change anything, you know, because you think that, now I have now once, I think I did tell this story about, um, one of my writing partners said, oh, don't make that a journal entry, write it out, you know, write the, write the whole thing out. And I remember doing it. Um, and I remember even in the Marine Corps, I remember sitting there, like we'd be having these stupid, boring classes. And I'd be like writing a story, like writing a little, you know, writing a story. And it's funny because um, they went, I went to San Diego for um, temporary duty. And I don't know why, but they went into my room. I think they needed the room for something else. I don't know what went on. Anyway, they went in my room and I never got my, my notebooks that I had written my stories and stuff back from. I never got them back. They, I don't, they took them. I don't know why, but anyway, whatever. Um, what I was going to talk about was some of my um, favorite scenes in, um, I think I said, um, in the, in my, in autumn, in the 1820, um, uh, stories, it's, it's a lot of, um, I have a lot of favorite scenes in there. One of my favorite scenes is um, when the villain dies. He, um, the slave catchers come and get him. They take him back to Georgia. And there, you know, it's being described how he's going to live the rest of his life with a head cage on and bells on him. And, you know, he's going to eat the same thing three times a day and he's going to, you know, um, um, you know, no one's going to speak to you. You don't speak to anybody. You don't go to any celebrations. You don't do anything. You know, you just work alone and stuff like that. And he decides because he's made a metamorphosis from when we first meet him, he's very, very basic and he's just reactive and he's just, you know, it, it, he doesn't even do what's in his best interest because he is so um, hell bent on making this woman who did nothing really um, pay. And from his guilt and his insecurity and those kind of things, he comes all this way instead of when he got off the plantation to go into Canada, just keep going, going to New York, going where there was, you know, no slavery. He chose to follow a, female who had done nothing to him except, you know, be with a, um, I don't know what, well, I think where he came from is a sense of, um, powerlessness. And I think he comes, he, 
comes from a place of um, wanting to get back at this woman, my main character, wanting to get back at her so badly that actually in his mind, he's made this whole thing up. And I really started um, actually making him quite mad. But then as I, <laughs> preheating, um, then as I went along, he's one of the people I think I told you guys about as, you know, he went as you as he went along and as I went along as I uh, matured because a lot of times um, we'll write write a character have real bad things happen to him because they remind us of somebody you know that in real life we couldn't really hurt or you know you wouldn't really hurt but doggone it you can write it you know and make them um, you can do anything you want you know when you write and this particular character he goes through this change and it basically happens once he gets arrested you know once he gets arrested and once he's in jail and once he um becomes com constructive and once he's you know he's not drinking anymore and once once he's eating three meals a day and everything then his mindset changes and right about the time when he decides and the sad part is right about the time he decides, wait a minute, you know, I could have made some different choices. This ironically would have been the one place, you know, that he followed this poor woman to, to make her pay for something she didn't do, um, would have probably been the town where he could have lived, uh, you know, a good life. He sees, um, successful black men, men just like himself. Um, of course, they had the op they had different opportunities they could read and write these kind of things but he sees that his life could have been different and he decides to ring all he can and he um it's one thing he says he discovers his manhood he discovers um that you know he doesn't have to he can get things done without being a boo-boo you know clown shuffling with his head down yes and no so he he realizes that he actually can get um he could have actually had some choices, even though, of course, black men and black women, anybody of color, of course, back then, Native Americans just murdered. But I mean, they still have choices. You know, they still have choices. And that reminds me of something that they asked me at the interview. They asked me this the last interview I went on, um, what was the cause of poverty in the world? And I said, the first thing that came up in my head, I said, a lack of education. And I think that's what it boils down to. It's a lack of education as far as um, the consequences of paying for the choices that we make. Um, also, the lack of um, education in terms of how we think about the poor, you know, and, and um a lack of education in terms of what a woman's choices are. You know, you can, you know, yeah, there are probably millionaire women. I imagine there are. No, I know that there are. I believe Whoopi Goldberg was a single welfare mom, if I'm not mistaken. I'm sorry, Whoopi, if I got it wrong. But there are a lot of people who are poor. Kurt Cobain was homeless. You know what I mean? But it was just something in them. And he learns the fight. And he learns he's had choices and he learns, um, you know, things could have been better, even though he doesn't have, you know, every opportunity that there are, were opportunities and that he probably could have gone, you know, had a family and had the things he wants. And I think, um, towards the end before they come, that's another one of my favorite, um, scenes is when he says goodbye to his, um, son. You know, because he never had anything and he thinks he says to himself, well, this is my punishment. This is my punishment. I've never had anything to lose before except my life. I've never had anything to lose before. And now that I have the most important thing a man can have, you know, a son, I'm going to lose him. And that's my punishment. I think he feels that that's his punishment. And as he, um, um, as he, um, goes through this change. It was very difficult for me because I had wanted him to be a certain way and I wanted him to die a certain way. And I wanted, you know, things to be, and he just took out, you know, to get some of the stuff out of me, but he took it upon himself to the character, took it upon himself to change.
change, you know, to, to change his ideas, to change his, um, the way he's look, he looks at life and realize that he could have had some of the things that, you know, um, some other men, that's one of, that's one of the scenes that made me cry right before he's getting ready to leave to his um, trip back to Georgia. And then I kind of, I didn't write a lot about the trip to Georgia. I kind of had that like a flashback because that wasn't important. The important thing was once he got back and the feeling that, um, he didn't want to live this life. He didn't want to live this, um, life of, um, you know, this, this blank white sheet of paper life is what I call it. He, he didn't want to live that. He'd rather take his life. And that was one thing he could control because he had said that earlier that, um, he, um, he resented being sent back to Georgia where he committed his crimes in Missouri. He was, he, he resented. And these are feelings that were new to him. You know, he knew anger and hunger and, you know, you know, vindictiveness and, and lust and those kind of uh, feelings. But, you know, he never been um, insulted, really. You know, how dare you just ship me back? He says, how dare you just ship me back to Georgia? Like I'm a, you know, a, a piece of farm machinery or something when I'm a man and, you know, you're a man, but you decide my fate by stroke of your pen because, you know, I'm not, I'm not free. And I think he really finds out the meaning of freedom. And the same thing with um, my main character, the woman, she, my female lead character, she thought she was going to live a certain life for the rest of her life. She thought she was going to be a um, pampered, privileged, you know, slave for the rest of her life you know, and with her own home and, you know, that's how it was going to be. And she was going to be with um, her lover forever. And, you know, that's how, you know, it was going to be. And I think when he marries someone else, not only does it hurt her as a woman that he married someone else, but it hurts her because she, the realization comes to her that they can't completely be together. They can't completely be a couple that, you know, he has to marry this white woman. And also it, um, it shows her how, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Mercenary. He could be, he wants this plantation. He wants to have his own plantation. He wants his own place. He's tired of living in his father's, you know, um, foot, steps, you know, in his father's shadow. And he decides he wants this and the naivety of them both, because the naivety of him is that, well, everything's going to be all right. I'm just, I'm going to marry this, this white woman to get her father's, um, inherit her father's plantation. It doesn't mean anything to me. So why would, you know, what's her name? My character, I don't want to call their names. Why should she care that, you know, it doesn't mean anything. I just have to have a child by this woman to leave, you know, my, um, a state to. And I think that opens up my character's eyes. She's not as naive anymore. And when she, um, you know, when he goes away on his quote unquote honeymoon and she's left, she thinks, well, I'm going to just do something. You know, I'm going to do something, really make him angry. And that's when she marries um, the slave um, man. That's her husband. And she thinks she naively thinks that, well, I'll give him food. I'll give him somewhere to live. I, I don't want him bothering me. We don't plan to live as man and wife. And she, and, and the meanness that she has is that she doesn't take into consideration that this is another human being. She, he means nothing to her. And the irony of this is that, um, because he's a slave, he means nothing to another slave of uh, that her, her, her statue, her, her privilege, um, gives her the idea, the feeling, the idea that he means nothing, you know, and I, and I really wrote that that way. I actually really wrote that in, you know, with that sense that she has a sense of just like the whites did on the plantation. This is a slave. He, he means nothing, but you know, I'm not going to live as I'm just doing this. I'm just marrying this man to, um, make, you know, my lover, um, angry and, when she's offered the ultimate thing, which was her freedom to leave, there's really nothing left at this point actually for her. So when she, you know, back in Georgia, so when she arrives in Missouri, she's really, you know, there's nothing, you know, she's, there's nothing. And then she gets there 
And she's made up her mind because, like I said before, she thinks she's going to a black man, a man of color, a well-to-do black man, and she finds out she's not. And she, um, she's just so shocked and, you know, she doesn't, she, she doesn't, she doesn't really know what to do, you know? And then when she's put into the position of power that she's in, which has always been her dream to be the mistress of her own plantation, suddenly she is in this a whole lot harder than what she thought it would be. And she still loves her, um, I think she still loves him. Yeah, she she still loves her 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 um um lover that she had back in Georgia, and of course he meets uh you know he meets someone else he gets someone else and he kind of moves on with his life you know and those kind of things and she moves along with her life but at some point they they get back together but I think um a lot of the um, naivete and that's something else that um I that I gave her was a certain um sexual naivete but in a way but not really because um her um lover from georgia she's you know they're they he's the only man she's ever been with but they were very free <laughs> i don't know another word for it and very ex, ex, uh experimental and so when she gets to um sleep with this other guy she doesn't you know she's afraid to you know, show him the things she knows. She's afraid to do that. And then, you know, he, you know, pretty much encourages her to, because like any other woman, you don't want to act like you know anything. You know, you don't want to act like you know anything because, you know, you don't, you know, you want the man to think, you know, that I don't know what, but I've done it. You know, I don't, you know, you want to act a little naive when it comes to um, sex. I mean, I still can, you know, work up a blush or two sometimes but um you know you don't want your sexual prowess to be known if she's a she's a very sexual person um and i put a lot of um like i said i don't write a lot of you know drippy sloppy love scenes but it's very evident that she's a very very uh sexual person and she's a very materialistic she can be a materialistic kind of person um she's um um she's not a virgin i didn't i didn't write her leaving her losing her virginity but it's kind of understood that's one some of the things that i wanted to go into was that you know some things are understood it's understood that when she lost her virginity she was like okay well is that all it is is that it <laughs> you know is that it but as he, as her lover in Georgia, comes back from school in Baltimore and he's learned different things, and like now he's more mature, that um, that's when their, you know, sexual activity, you know, um, it becomes very, very satisfying to her. And she's a very sexual person. As a matter of fact, that's the reason that she stays in Missouri with um, the Missouri farmer character is for physical reasons. She likes him you know she he's handsome and she likes him you know and she gets a chance she has a little adopted daughter because he has a daughter he's adopted and you know she has she's always wanted children she loves children but like i said she was determined not to give birth to a slave and when she has her own home and she's the mistress and she has to um she has a place in the community and she's a leader in the community and all these things that you know comes with being you know your own mr she has to learn these things again you know one of her favorite sayings to him is that you know look i didn't own myself you know and i think it one of my yeah one of my favorite scenes that kind of shows that is she wants some rose bushes moved and so she tells him look can you have one of your men move those wild roses you know into my um into my um um, uh, you know, in the front of the house to decorate the house. And he says, well, if you want it done, you do it, you know, and she's not used to bossing a white man around. And then that's one of the um, issues that confront her when she goes to New Orleans and she tells, you know, and all her, the servants in the house are white and except the cook and like one little maid. And, um, he tells her, well, look, when you get to England, none of the servants there are going to be black. So you have to, you know, learn to, you know, you know, handle uh, a staff, you know, that 
you know it's going to be white when they get to England. So that's enough of that. I'm going to do a little bit about um, something. I don't know. Maybe one more. One more, maybe two more. 